Well, dear friends, welcome to the Sunday in Labor Day. Somehow the summer has flown past and we are at the end of it. A couple of facts for you about this weekend that you may or may not already know. In 1882, the Knights of Labor, which at the time was an illegal labor union, the forerunner of the AFL-CIO, uh, had to meet secretly, and they were meeting secretly in New York City for their secret convention. You can imagine the secret convention must have seemed kind of absurd even to them. So at the end, they decided they would have a public parade to announce their presence to the community. A little later, in 1887, the first state made Labor Day a holiday. Do we know what state it was? There was one person at 8 o'clock who should have known, and she did not. It was Oregon. Yes, Oregon was the first state. And in 1894, it became a federal holiday. What you may not know, because I didn't until I looked all these useless facts up, is that originally there was the intent that there should also be something called Labor Sunday. The Sunday before Labor Day, which would be today, was intended to be a time when we were to think about the educational and spiritual aspects of labor. Now, obviously, this never caught on, but it isn't a bad idea. Obviously, you and I come here every Sunday. For us, every Sunday is Labor, Day, uh, labor Sunday. We come here every week to try to figure out what it means to be laboring in the kingdom of God, to be laboring in God's vineyard. But maybe it's not a bad idea once in a while to stop and ask ourselves, what are the spiritual aspects of labor? Or perhaps what are the work aspects of spirituality? It is maybe providential that we get this lesson from the letter of James this morning, talking about being doers of the word and not simply hearers. We might imagine that it's easy enough to say, oh, I know what a doer of the word is. I know I'm a doer of the word. I, I, I don't need to have that explained to me. I'll go away and do it. I think it's wise that the writer of the letter put in there this idea that you look in the mirror and you recognize yourself and you turn around and walk away and have no idea who you are again. There's something about being reminded of these things, even by doing them, that reinforces them for us. And so I think it is worth talking about what it means to be a doer of the Word. But first, we have to talk about what it means to be near to God. We hear that in the Old Testament lesson this morning. What other great nation has a God that is so near to it? That was partly what Jesus was trying to help his listeners understand in the gospel this morning. He says it frequently through the gospel. It isn't literally in these words this morning, but we hear it many other places from him and from other people. The kingdom of God has come near to you. You can imagine the irony when these people are disputing about what it means to be faithful and do what you're supposed to do as a faithful follower of God when God in the person of Jesus, the eternal Son of God, is standing right there in front of them. They don't seem to understand that something changes when we are in the presence of God. You and I understand that in all that we do as followers of Jesus, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus is among us, and so we are always in the presence of God. That ought to change us. Indeed, it does change us. I don't want to suggest that it makes us perfect in some plastic sort of way. The early church had to wrestle with this. I've told you this before. There was an assumption in the early church that once you became a Christian, you never sinned again. It became apparent very quickly the Christians did go on sinning and were pretty good at it. So it's not about being made perfect, but somehow it's about being a doer of the word anyway. It's about somehow revaluing our actions, revaluing our, our understandings and our judgments of our own behavior in light of the fact that we are always in the presence of God. We are always doers of the word and since the word is Jesus, we are always doers of Jesus. What the people in the story this morning were arguing about were the elements of, of what had come down to them as the law of Moses. If you go back and look at the first five books of the Bible, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you won't find a lot of these things that they're talking about. There's some basic principles there that underlie them. 
but it seems that even by their time, an, an enormous number of things had been accreted on top of it. If we do this, we really should do this too. And if we're doing these two things, we really have to do these other five things too, or we're being hypocritical. So they come up with this really complex way of living. You'll note, if you go back and read the lesson carefully, it says that they, they, talk, they talk about observing the traditions of the elders, which kind of gives you a hint that all this has come down to them in a way that isn't entirely supported, perhaps, by what the law of Moses said. Now, I don't want to suggest to you that it was all bad. I'm not going to stand in the pulpit or this place that passes for the pulpit and tell you not to wash your hands. That has actual value. There are things we do that have actual value, and we shouldn't neglect that. We should remember when we're doing them in a spiritual context why it is that we're doing them. The whole law of Moses, everything that's in there, was intended to remind Israel that it was the people of God and that God was its shepherd, its king. It was meant to remind them that they were close to God, to be near all the time to God, to have it constantly in their memory. This is what I'm saying. If, if every day, every gesture, every action is in some way a reminder of the presence of God. You really can't get past it. You never are turning away from the mirror. The trouble was they came to think of these things as being actions of God, as being ways that they were, were doing the Word. They were doing their faith. But if you read the way they express them, the way they talk about them, it seems that they weren't doing them with a whole lot of love. I think grimly following the rules, grimly trying to be charitable, grimly trying to be forgiving, really doesn't help us much. Even worse, if we imagine we're doing these things as a way of scoring points somehow with someone, least of all with God. This is what Jesus was trying to help his listeners to understand that in reality we do these things only insofar as we do them for the right reasons, do them in love, and do them as acts of God. It might be easy to imagine this is all 2,000 years ago, stuff that other people were doing. We don't really worry about make, making pots kosher anymore, at least most of us don't. But we do it too. You think about what Christians do lighting candles and saying prayers and the way we structure our, our church room, the way, that we, uh, the way that we do church on Sunday, the fact that we continue to come back here week after week, these could easily become habits that we imagine are somehow doing the Word but until we stop and look at what lies under them, the reason why we're doing them. We don't really know. This is a topic that you can get me started on, and once you do, it's hard to get me to stop. And so I promise I won't get too far into it, but think about the things that churches do frequently. We give away food. We give away clothing. Many churches give away diapers. We provide various services to people. We give help in all kinds of forms. Those are all very valid things. People need to eat. They need to be clothed. They, they certainly have value in and of themselves, but it's worth stopping to ask why we as a church are doing those things. If someone walked in the door, some stranger walked in the door of this place and said, why do you have a food pantry? Would we be able to give an account of our faith, if I may quote from another source, in that action? Is it just because we think people need Nutella and laundry detergent? No. No. It says something about being Christ-like and recognizing Christ in the person who is in need. Until we recognize that, until we have that underpinning for it, we're not really doing the Word, we're just handing out breakfast cereal. This should apply to absolutely everything that we do individually and everything that we do as a community as we're coming into our season of annual giving and budgeting for the year. This should be prominent in our thinking. We give to the church as an act of God, in the presence of God. We write a budget for the church as an act of God, in the presence of God. We certainly choose priorities for the church, which then tend to drive the way that we spend our money. 
in light of what we understand ourselves to be as a group of doers of the word. We must do those things in love. If we fail to, then we have missed the point. On the other side, if we do in fact do them in love, I want to suggest to you there's a whole lot that shouldn't be all that important to us. I want to suggest to you that it would be a beautiful gesture to feed someone with our unclean hands. It would be a beautiful gesture to help someone up with our unclean hands be a beautiful gesture to somehow try to heal the world with our unclean hands. Because those are the same hands with which we receive absolutely everything that God has promised to give us. The hands with with which we receive Jesus himself. So, dear friends, on this Labor Sunday, let's not overlook the reasons why we do what we do. Let us act in love. Let us be doers of Jesus today and always. Amen.